I see trees of green. Red roses, too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, bright, blessed days, dark, sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of a rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Quite simply wonderful. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and what a wonderful way to start this sixth WTM World Responsible Tourism Day. I'm very proud to be back with you for a sixth time. For those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Stephen Sacker. I'm the presenter of Hard Talk on BBC World News, and I'm especially proud to say that BBC World News is sponsoring World Responsible Tourism Day in conjunction in association with the UN's World Tourism Organization. Now I wished you all a very good morning. It is of course an extraordinarily bright and good morning for Barack Obama. Not quite such a brilliant day so far for Mitt Romney. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean that as a particularly partisan point but I I get the feeling of where you're coming from. But the point is, uh, I don't know if you were up bright and early this morning or if indeed you pulled an all-nighter and were sticking with the coverage throughout the night. But it was very interesting, I think, that Barack Obama, who didn't choose to go heavy on uh, sustainability and environmental issues during the campaign, I think for obvious reasons, given the nature of public opinion in the U.S. right now, it was interesting that in his... Uh, speech in Chicago uh, after the victory became clear, he did make a point of mentioning his commitment to sustainability issues, to the environment and to the climate change agenda. So I would like to think that were he here today, and of course he's got a few other things on his plate, but were Barack Obama here today, he would be delighted to see the work that is being done uh, on this particular day with this particular commitment from the travel and tourism industry. We are going to hear from uh, a fantastic speaker who's going to tell us a great deal about very important conservation work going on in Africa a little bit later on. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. I'm simply going to add that when people ask me, Stephen, who was your best interview or your best experience on Hard Talk this year, I say to them, you know what, it wasn't a human being, it was an encounter with an elephant. An elephant in a, an amazing uh, orphanage elephant sanctuary just outside no Nairobi, which some of you may have visited, run by a wonderful woman called Dame Daphne Sheldrick. Dame Daphne takes young elephants that have lost their parents through poaching, and poaching is an extraordinarily grave problem right now in, Nairo in Kenya and other countries neighboring Kenya. She takes these baby elephants and she raises them. Her staff bottle feed these baby elephants for two years to enable them to survive and then she puts them back 
into Kenya's national parks. It's wonderful work. It's something that I loved seeing, albeit just for one afternoon. And you're going to hear more about the importance of that kind of conservation a little bit later on today. So there's a lot to look forward to. But my first duty and pleasure this morning is to introduce to you uh, somebody who's been a driving force behind uh, World Responsible Tourism Day from its inception. It's the chairman, your friend and familiar figure here, chairman of WTM, Fiona Jeffrey. So, Fiona, up you come. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Baroness Morris, Chairman of World Travel Markets Advisory Council, Talib Rifai, Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, Charlie Mayhew, Founder and CEO of Tusk, and our guests of honor at this year's opening ceremony, Wolfgang Newman, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Residor Hotel Group, and our guest speaker at Hot Seat. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. A giant tortoise, called Lonesome Dorge, died earlier this year in Ecuador's Galapagos National Park at the magnificent age of 100. An amusing bit of trivia, you might think. In fact, this story has wider universal significance. Lonesome George was first discovered by a Hungarian scientist on the Galapagos island of Pinta in 1972 and got environmentalists across the world very excited. Lonesome George and his species, you see, was believed to have become extinct. Inevitably, he then took a starring role in the Galapagos National Park breeding program. And after 15 years of living with a female tortoise, Lonesome George did indeed mate. But the eggs proved infertile. With no offspring, Lonesome George was the rarest creature on Earth. The fate of Lonesome George and his species is a terrible condemnation of what's going on in the world today. Scientists estimate that literally dozens of species on land and sea are becoming extinct every day. The Center for Biological Diversity in Tucson, Arizona, tells us that our planet is now in the midst of its sixth mass extinction of plants and animals, the sixth wave of extinctions in the past half billion years. In fact, we're currently experiencing the worst spate of lost species since the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But like me, I hope you enjoyed that What a Wonderful World film by the BBC at the start of this opening ceremony, which serves to underline the sheer beauty of diversity, extraordinary wildlife, amid magnificent backdrops. It's sites like these that combined with good conservation practice draws thousands of tourists every single day of the year. Wildlife, the environment, and the activity of the industry, and for that matter, all human beings, are of course crucially linked, which is why this is our focus at today's opening ceremony. As Stephen has said, today marks World Travel Market's sixth World Responsible Tourism Day, building on our work over the last 20 years, but it also signals an even more important anniversary. Ten years ago, a conference was organized by the Responsible Tourism Partnership and Western Cape Tourism, preceding the World Summit on Sustainable Development. It's important because even though there were fewer than 300 industry professionals from 20 countries, that relatively modest meeting symbolized the start of a new, more caring, more enlightened era for the industry, resulting in the Cape Town Declaration. Simply put, the Declaration underlined responsible tourism as creating better places for people to live in and better places for people to visit. The Declaration set out a framework for the industry to follow, reducing negative economic, environmental and social impacts, improving the lives of communities so often left struggling at the bottom of the pile involving them in decisions that affect their lives and making positive contributions to the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. When we launched WTM World Responsible Tourism Day with our friends at UNWTO, we wanted to make that difference, to change the way the industry did business, 
to promote the business case for responsible tourism, driving prosperity for all the stakeholders, and ensuring that as an industry we ultimately hand over our world to the next generation with our heads held high. We want to communicate, educate, provoke healthy debate, and above all be inspired by events such as the presentation of the Responsible Tourism Awards that follow this ceremony and of which I have privileged to be one of the judging panel. We've also been encouraging companies large and small to sign up to becoming an official supporter of WTM World Responsible Tourism Day, which offers many profiling opportunities, but also means they're able to use the official logo with pride on their own communications and sales materials. The criteria to become an official supporter is a strict one and adheres to the principles laid down by the Cape Town Declaration of 2002. This year, we've over 200 companies throughout the world who've been recognized. And what's remarkable is that not only are they enthusiastically involved in year-round responsible tourism, but many of them mark WTM World Responsible Tourism Day with their own special events. Everything from beach cleaning operations to local awards and consumer promotions. It's a small beginning, given the number of companies in the travel and tourism industry worldwide, but it is a beginning. Every year, more people jump aboard the responsible tourism wagon, but the challenge for the industry is to ensure that those companies and destinations who claim to be responsible are just that. As an industry, we need honest, transparent information about what they're doing and what they've achieved, and so do customers. World Travel Market's Responsible Tourism Day program has become so popular with delegates that it now spans three days, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, but inevitably the main emphasis is on today. Staging a varied program of responsible tourism events is in itself not new. However, we try to make these sessions as focused and direct as possible, prompting the industry to take a large, long, hard look at itself without propaganda and hype. Our latest initiative is WTM Speakers Corner. It's named after the historic Speakers Corner in London's Hyde Park, which, which for more than 150 years has attracted huge crowds to listen and to air their views, debate and raise hot topics that not everyone will necessarily agree with. Here at World Travel Market, it allows delegates the opportunity to talk about their own responsible tourism activity, explore contentious opinion and ethical trends. Located on the exhibition floors in the North and South Halls, 13 brave responsible tourism activists are speaking out for the maximum of 10 minutes each. It's a lot of fun, but there's a serious purpose behind the smiles and the innovation. To me, WTM World Responsible Tourism Day is a melting pot for ideas, often confronting controversy, and making everyone think a little more deeply about the future sustainability of our industry. The aim of this year's Responsible Tourism Programme has been to be very focused, unearthing key subjects that really need our attention, including child protection, volunteering, carbon emissions, and the preservation of our natural and cultural heritage. A session on Thursday also shines a spotlight on issues surrounding accessibility for the disabled. There are many disabled travellers who have given up trying to book a holiday because of obstacles that are put in their way from the moment they try to make a reservation. Yes, there is some progress being made, but not nearly enough. Collectively, the industry often turns its back on the disabled, ignoring their pleas for better access, which allows them to take a holiday without fear of discrimination or embarrassment. If we look ahead to the growth of an ageing population that is used to the opportunity to travel, we are, in my view, currently acting as an industry irresponsibly, and this is a community that needs to be better recognised and serviced. But there is one ongoing and complex debate above all others that demands deeper discussion and that's the amount of global greenhouse gases the industry is responsible for, balancing the beneficial and harmful effects of international tourism. 
So can there be a middle ground? And can the industry become a force for environmental as well as economic good? Should governments take over and make the amount of carbon emissions a matter of statutory legislation? Or can results be achieved? This afternoon, two teams will line up for our WTM World Responsible Tourism Day keynote debate with World Travel Market's Responsible Tourism Advisor, Professor Harold Goodwin, ensuring fair play. I'm glad to say, though, that we're not alone in tackling this difficult topic. I'm delighted that Wolfgang Newman, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Residor Hotel Group, one of the world's fastest growing hotel companies, who from the beginning of next year becomes the group's new president and CEO. Wolfgang will be taking WTM World Responsible Tourism Day's hot seat here on the stage later this morning. Those of you who know hot seat are aware that this is a prestigious, but also, unusually for this kind of event, a hard-talking and frank assessment of significant achievement in responsible tourism. Wolfgang will be chatting to Stephen about Residor's new group-wide initiative, Think Planet, and his aim to save energy in more than 330 hotels in 70 countries with a total of 95,000 rooms. The Think Planet program aims to reduce consumption of 25% by 2016 in all Residor hotels in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, including Radisson Blue, Park Inn by Radisson and Hotel Missoni. It's certainly a big ask and we'll look forward with interest to hearing about how such a large expanding group of hotels like Residor can set an ambitious goal to reduce energy on such a large scale in a relatively short time. <laughs> now I want to go back to the beginning, the story of Lonesome George, what this means to the world and particularly travel and tourism. The truth is that without conservation taking a central role in responsible tourism, we and the planet will be dramatically poorer. There's one world famous person who cannot be with us today but who nevertheless is passionate about balancing environmental conservation with the growing needs of society, believing it's at the very heart of what he describes as the greatest challenge facing mankind. Prince William is an active royal patron of Tusk, Africa's leading conservation organization, helping its founder and CEO, Charlie Mayhew, whenever he can. Take a look at this. Having friends in high places is crucial for an endangered species like the black rhino. Cats particularly going down well, aren't they? <laughs> Zawadi has spent the first five years of her life in captivity, but that's about to change. Her keepers here at Portland Wildlife Park in Kent are preparing her for a new life in Tanzania. It's hoped she'll breed and help boost rhino numbers there. They're two of the most heavily poached animals um, currently in the world. And if we don't do something about them, it's going to be a tragic loss for everyone. He says he's speaking out to raise awareness because the killing of black rhino is now so out of control, they may soon be extinct. Images you see of these elephant and rhino faces being hacked off to feed a, a, a market that is just driven by appalling ignorance, it seems to me, it is, is really upsetting. The demand for rhino horn is driven by a market mainly in Vietnam and China. It's perceived to have medicinal properties. There's no scientific evidence to support that, but it's so sought after, it's now more expensive than gold and seen by some as a luxury must-have. My message to them is simply stop. Um, it's, it's a message about educating people and understanding that when you buy that rhino horn or when you buy ivory, you, you are taking this from an animal that has been slaughtered for this decorative ornament you have on your mantelpiece or you have at home. Is, is that really what you, what you desire and you think is right in the world? For someone who isn't aware of that taking place, we can have the education. What would you sit down in a room with someone who does know that that's what the situation is and are carrying on regardless? Well, I think they're extremely um, ignorant, I think selfish, I think wrong, totally and utterly wrong. Makes you angry, I can tell. Yeah, it makes me very angry, yeah. It's a waste. Zawadi, whose name means gift in Swahili, could offer new hope. On the day of departure, she's crated, 
sedated and loaded onto a cargo plane. Good girl, darling. Hello, love. 24 hours later, and she's welcomed by an African son and a very relieved team. It's amongst uh, one of the biggest things in my life to be able to bring these animals, condition them to the wild and get them breeding here and bring them back. It's fantastic. How sad that we have to go to a European source to back up our rhinos. Come on in, babe. Tony Fitzjohn is the man charged with the rhino's care. He says Zawadi and the two other rhinos who came with her will have armed guards 24 hours a day. But both he and the Aspinall Foundation, which donated them, accept there is a limit to what else they can do. Kate Silverton, BBC News. Currently, Tusk is at the forefront of the fight to save wild animals, becoming a distant memory for tourists. The situation in Africa has reached catastrophic proportions, with poaching sweeping through the continent, decimating wildlife, and damaging national and local economies, including the travel and tourism industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome WTM World Responsible Tourism Day's opening ceremony, guest of honour, Charlie Mayhew, founder and CEO of Tusk. Thank you, Fiona, for your very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prince, like his father, has indeed taken a proactive role in helping to raise the profile of some of the big conservation issues that we face today. And Tusk is incredibly fortunate to have him as our patron, both here in the UK and in the USA. And perhaps more importantly, he speaks for a younger generation who are set to inherit the world that we choose to leave him. The short clip that you just saw highlights one of the greatest challenges facing conservationists in Africa today. The re-emergence of rhino poaching, stimulated by demand for rhino horn from the Far Eastern consumers willing to pay exorbitant prices for a few ounces of rhino horn powder in the mistaken belief that it will cure them of some ailment. The truth is that taking rhino horn is little different to biting your fingernail. It is something that has no medicinal value whatsoever. And yet in some markets, rhino horn is selling for $40,000 a kilo and more, making it more valuable than gold. It's complete folly. And yet it's a tragic reality that this is an iconic species which has been on this planet for more than 50 million years and is itself a huge draw to tourists in Africa, could go extinct in a mere generation. Now, Tusk was founded in 1990 against the backdrop of Africa's last great poaching crisis, when hundreds of thousands of elephants were being slaughtered for their ivory. Over the last two decades, the charity has successfully raised and invested in excess of $25 million into a broad range of field projects. Our goal is not only to protect Africa's wildlife, particularly endangered species, whether they be elephant, rhino, gorilla, big cats, or even turtles, but to use conservation as a means to promote sustainable development and improve education. We believe that conservation is ultimately about people. Wildlife and wilderness areas will only exist if man allows them to exist. And our approach recognises that long-term success of conservation ultimately relies upon our ability to fully engage with local communities living alongside wildlife. It's an integrated approach. Today, Tusk's, Tusk invests in an extensive portfolio of projects, approximately 50 across 17 African countries. 
we've learnt that conservation can be a powerful tool in helping to alleviate poverty, increase security, and even provide the foundations for conflict resolution between tribal groups. For a country like Kenya, 70% of its wildlife lives outside national parks. This rich wildlife heritage is immensely valuable in terms of tourism potential for Kenya's overall GDP. And the same is true of many other countries in Africa and around the world. So making conservation relative to the lives of ordinary rural Africans is critical. Wildlife has to become their asset. Tusk has been at the forefront of investing in community-based initiatives since 1993, first in Zimbabwe, but perhaps the best example now is a growing collection of community-owned and managed conservancies in northern Kenya. Twenty years ago, this particular region of Samburu had been at the heart of the ivory killing fields, an insecure land that few people and certainly no tourists were willing to tread. Today, it has become a safe haven for wildlife and a flagship initiative to show how responsible tourism can bring tangible and financial benefits to the local communities. With the support of Tusk and under the auspices of the Northern Rangelands Trust, this visionary approach, pioneered by Ian Craig of the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, has recovered a vast tract of habitat that covers nearly three million acres of community land. The transition has been extraordinary and the benefits are clear to the people. 19 individual community-owned conservancies have been established under a common conservation model that now benefits 150,000 people. Indeed, there's no shortage of communities in Kenya queuing up to adopt the same model. What is exciting about the Northern Rangelands is how these conservancies now offer some of the very best wilderness tourism experiences in Africa. Lodges and camps like Sarara, Saruni, Ilinguezi and Sasab are all stunning examples of a symbiotic relationship between tourism and communities. Sarara is earning over $150,000 per annum for the 5,000 community members of Naminak. I'm proud that Tusk recognised and invested in this groundbreaking model from the very beginning, and it is one that we're keen to replicate elsewhere across Africa where we can. In the Maasai Mara, too, we're supporting a similar move by communities to form successful conservancies around the famous park. As ever in the developing world, education is key for Tusk. For Tusk, it represents one of the cornerstones for successful conservation in Africa. We invest nearly a third of our funds each year into education-related programs. And this includes a significant investment into the construction and refurbishment of schools, both primary and secondary, in poor rural areas close to the key conservation projects that we support. We also fund a portfolio of environmental education centres designed to host children on short residential courses and providing many of them with their first experience and understanding of the bush or wildlife. Notwithstanding all our achievements and conservation gains, the poaching crisis that I referred to at the beginning has returned with a vengeance. But it's not just the rhino that is under threat. Lion populations are crashing and now number less than 20,000. And the African elephant is once again succumbing to unprecedented demand for its ivory, driven by consumers in the Far East and China. Today, Africa's elephant population could be as low as 400,000, down from 600,000 in 1989 and 1.3 million in 1979. The figures are shocking. And some estimates suggest that as many as 35,000 elephants were slaughtered by poachers for their tusks last year. Indeed, a couple of weeks ago, Hong Kong seized an illegal shipment of four tons of ivory, made up of 1,209 tusks and worth $3.4 million. 
the escalation of the trade has demonstrated that the existing CITES framework is no longer fit for purpose and it urgently needs to be restructured by the international community with a total domestic and international ban on trade being reinforced. Tusk is working with a number of organisations to simultaneously combat the poaching on the ground, increase law enforcement, deliver harsher penalties, whilst exploring a bold new initiative which aims to break the deadlock between these countries who wish to introduce the tr reintroduce the trade versus a clear majority of African states who have stated the need to strengthen the existing ban. Right now, much of Tusk's effort is focused on trying to combat the issue on the ground, with an increased investment into anti-poaching teams. But the organised crime syndicates and terrorism groups, who now use ivory and rhino horn to fund their arms and operations, appear to have the upper hand. Supporting conservation on the front line is clearly essential, but collectively we must now also focus on consumer nations. Our goal must be to make the consumption of ivory and rhino horn socially unacceptable the world over. Tusk has worked with many companies with business interests in Africa, none more so than the safari industry, and I'm pleased to say that we have a number of companies who have become travel partners to Tusk, generously supporting and promoting the work to their our work to their clients. I've always believed that the travel industry has an important role to play in conservation. After all, the safari sector's future success and profits rely upon the survival of wildlife and wild areas. For without the elephant, rhino, lion, cheetah, the great apes, turtles, marine life, the attraction and value of such holidays will be severely diminished. And if the profits disappear, alternative and competing forms of land use will soon take over in places such as the Masai Mara. We can't let this happen. I've naturally focused on Africa, the continent that I know best. But the parallels can be drawn elsewhere in the world, with the plight of the tiger, jaguar, turtles, whales and dolphins. We need a responsible tourism industry as a partner to conservation. Tourism is a major contributor to the wealth of many countries, and the industry has a powerful voice which can help to persuade governments to act in support of the environment and conservation enforcing laws that protect biodiversity and coming down hard on criminals or irresponsible business who seek to destroy it. I want to leave you with this classic photograph of a famous elephant matriarch, Kumquat, and her family taken in Amboseli National Park, Kenya. Kumquat is one of Amboseli's finest remaining old matriarchs, and she was born in 1969. Here she is with her two daughters, Kwai and Quantina. The photo was taken actually just 10 days ago, on the 27th of October, below Mount Kilimanjaro. But 24 hours later, all three adult elephants were killed by gunfire, gunned down and their faces chainsawed off. The older calf is missing and the younger calf has been taken to Daphne Sheldrick's orphanage that Stephen mentioned earlier. Three days later, the game rangers from Big Life Foundation, funded by Tusk, tracked down the poacher and in conjunction with KWS arrested him. I'm afraid this is the reality of what's happening every day in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't let this continue and governments Law enforcement agencies, conservationists and the global travel industry all need to work together to ensure that it stops. I believe we can. And so, with no further ado, I have great pleasure in opening the 6th WTM World Respons Responsible Tourism Day in association with the UN WTA. Thank you very much indeed.